Okay, great. Uh, Jim, thank you very, very much. Uh, oh, very good. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Uh, great. And uh, it's also nice to see you at home, at the same home uh, you recorded the, <laughs> the video. That's right. <laughs> Nobody's moving anywhere. That's right. Um, okay, I think we have some, some question and answer and we have a hand up. Uh, may maybe actually, Tom, will you start with the hand, with, with, the, with the question and answer? Yeah, uh, the first uh, question came in from uh, Roberto Iglesias. Uh, he uh, is wondering if uh, the experts at MADAC are also looking at the EMMC uh, initiative in Europe. So, so I'm very familiar with the EMMC. Uh, uh, I've been sort of involved uh, in one way or the other uh, with that group and I think it's uh, excellent. A uh, thing, so uh, you know, only good things to say there. Uh, uh, you know, I' not exactly sure what uh, specific initiative that they're talking about here, but in general, the European Materials Modeling Council um, has done very good work, uh, particularly obviously in the case of, of modeling, to achieve this essentially identical goals to uh, the MGI in terms of you know interconnectedness of models. Uh, I know there's a very strong effort now in the you know, EMMC. Uh, on ontologies and trying to sort of uh, organize some of that information. And I would not be surprised if we heard something about that uh, during the conference. Uh, in addition, the Research Data Alliance, uh, which uh, a number of us have been very active in uh, since the early days, um, we have a, a working group on uh, materials modeling, of course, and uh, the MMC has now gotten involved with that group and so we're sort of partnering and trying to create a true international uh, effort to sort of make those bridges. So, so the short answer is yes, and that was the long answer. Very good, thanks. Okay, great. So there is a hand up from uh, Claudia Draxler, but still actually, uh, if there are more people who want to ask questions, just really write it down or uh, raise your hand. So Claudia, can you please ask your question or comment? Yeah, hi Jim. Um, actually, I'm wondering how strict the U.S. funding agencies are in forcing projects to follow some data plan to make data that's a, open. That's a great question. So, um, so you know, to be nice to my colleagues. Um, so the NSF, I think, has required data management plans since like 2012 or 10. It's a long time, um, but of course, requiring a plan is not the same thing as requiring a good plan. Um, and then of course, once you have the money, there's the question about whether or not uh, anybody ever enforces it. And the answer is essentially no. Um, so, you know, I'm a little leery. And of course I don't particularly like DMPs as a method for achieving a policy goal, which is in this case, we want people to share their data. Um, the problem is that, uh, it's, you know, in the end, it's just a plan. It's the execution that matters. And so the real question is around whether or not the data gets used if it's, you know, well-managed and shared in this fair ideas. So, you know, one of the ways that I'm thinking about this and trying to work it, in fact, into the MGI strategic plan is to actually say that the agencies want this, right? That this is actually something that uh, you know, we should strive for at a minimum and then try to figure out how we could put in place mechanisms uh, that reward such uh, behaviors. One of the things that uh, we found worked quite well, uh, and this was, uh, you know, kudos to the NSF for this, is still a lot of, you can go through a lot of the uh, sort of existing funded programs that had what looked like good data management activities and offer supplements to those grants after they've been awarded uh, to further enhance their data infrastructure. So they get uh, additional resources and a particularly dedicated, say, postdoc or, or graduate student to focus on some particular issue, work with perhaps another agency uh, or whatever to try and, and achieve those goals. Uh, if I can uh, comment on this one, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, we are introducing a policy where research evaluations uh, in particular look into the aspect uh, of open science, uh, to what uh, extent also the uh, research institute has contributed to the various open science uh, parts. 
Yeah, this is critical. And, you know, the peer review process is, of course, how most of these things are evaluated. And the question then becomes, do the peers <laughs> care about these things? Uh, and so, you know, there's this dangerous circle um, where, you know, most of the, a lot of our, the peer community has been around a long time. They've been very successful doing things the old way. Um, and so it may be that the data management plan is just, oh, you know, they have one, check the box. And so we'd like to see people move to something where they really care about it and it would ultimately damage the proposal in some sense if they didn't have it, hadn't been at least thoughtful about it. Yeah. There is an interesting follow-up question, uh, Matthias. Uh, uh, I cannot see the hand, so uh, I just read it. I, I think just read your uh, Q and A. I think. Uh, but the follow-up question from uh, Janeth uh, Magia is: uh, What would be the dynamics of that international data platform? Can we learn and adopt some of the mechanics of the free software communities and make it global and open? Yeah. So I, I, th I would sort of work backwards on that question. It's a great one. Um, certainly we've looked at, the, I mean, the software, free software movement is sort of, in some sense, the gold standard for how it would be implemented, right? And there was, I think a lot of us have been uh, certainly inspired uh, by that community, which has a completely different set of sort of rewards, as it were, right? People just publish all of their stuff essentially, essentially in real time. Um, and build off each other's work and have developed methods for both social credit and um, uh, uh, other kinds of essentially, you know, value uh, within the system in a very different way. And, you know, the way they're funded is very different. So obviously, as I said, we have an entrenched academic system uh, that rewards different behaviors and it has many good aspects and maybe not some, not great ones. So as far as the international uh, you know, platform is or whatever that looks like. Um, you know, we are going to adopt a lot of the ideas. We have, we are. Right? You could argue that a lot of the infrastructures we're standing up are are that. Uh, and to the extent that uh, all of the nations participating uh, view that information as essentially academic, right? Then there's no issues around export controls or things like that. Then it gets published, and there's drawing this bizarre arbitrary line between a paper and the data uh, sort of should go away. Uh, you know, the questions we're getting to are even harder ones though, right? When you start to talk about accessible and interoperable, now we're, you know, now we're really talking and uh, getting the stuff to interoperate, you know, is gonna be an ongoing activity. So also here, I invite more people to uh, raise their hands or bring up uh, interesting uh, topics. Well, it's not the case at the moment. So then I would say we simply go on. Or is there? there is I think we got one more. It's, the problem is typing is slower than. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I... uh, the question is from uh, Simon Moser. And uh, his uh, question is, uh, when you talk about incentive, my fear is that the individual research groups might not see and in fact actually not have an immediate benefit from publishing FAIR. Uh, the initiative is literally for the greater good. How does NIST want to motivate rather than threaten uh, individual who might not benefit? Right. And, 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 uh, uh... I mean, I, I completely agree, which is why I spent so much time in my talk talking about incentives. Um, the, the answer, in my opinion, is this notion of the individual research group would want to use the infrastructures to do science or engineering. In other words, they, they would, and, and as I, so it's asymmetric, right? They would put their data onto one of these platforms, do science, um, and as a condition of using those platforms, they would have to agree to make the data effectively fair or the platform itself would take care of much of the fairness operation. Um, and we have so many examples of this in other aspects of, you know, the internet uh, where, uh, you know, the reason that people use social media is not why the social media wants you to use their platforms, for example. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's how you monetize this. That's how you uh, figure out ways to, uh, not necessarily monetize, but you know, it, it incentivize the research piece of this. 
It's about the research, and that's what research groups want. Okay, we have one uh, raised hand. It's uh, Mark Greiner. And uh, Mark, can you please start? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Jim. Um, this is uh, still the incentives issue. Um, I was wondering, what's your take? I mean, do you think we can take a page out of the book from like uh, open source software? And, and I mean, those communities in terms of sharing data and being open are really, really thriving. Uh, things like, I, I, I sometimes wonder, I mean, what motivates someone to be extremely active on, on platforms like uh, Stack Overflow or, or publishing, you know, huge open source frameworks. Uh, is there something that we could maybe transfer from that and apply it to, to the scientific fields like material science? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a long answer. It's related to the other ones, but, uh, you know, the question, if there was a project called Depsy, D-E-P-S-Y, which you can still look up, it's depsy.org. And what it did was it went through the Python and R packages um, that are publicly, you know, in all these repositories and was able to generate metrics around open source, okay? And so, uh, so that's the sort of dream if you start to stay inside the academic model where we could actually finally have demonstrated impact, right, from uh, publishing our data, for example. Uh, so that, that would sort of, it sort that would sort of start driving behaviors that you could demonstrate to a tenure committee. Now, of course, that's sort of buying into, that's sort of importing our culture or the academic culture onto, uh, you know, the software, uh, problem. You could try to do it the other way around where you say, you know, somebody on Stack Overflow, they have a totally different set of sort of social credit, uh, you know, and reputation, but if you think about the way academics behave, again, it is a reputation-based system. You know, our notion of fame is that, you know, 400 people might know your name. That would be big win, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you can imagine that kind of a, an incentive system too, where essentially a lot of people say, this person is really good. His data is the best. I tr trust him. He's made it as fair as possible. He's awesome or she's awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't, that's easy to imagine, you know, how do we get there? I still think that's, you know, may, that's why I'm talking a lot about incentives, right? I think one idea is, for example, the, the feedback loop, the, the iteration time for a publication is quite long. Yeah. And quite expensive. Yes. So to, to, before you get any recognition for a contribution, you, you have to go pretty full in, whereas, you know, qu quite a ways in and invest a lot of time and money. Whereas, when you get little contributions in Stack Overflow or from writing a blog or from posting some uh, open source uh, code, uh, this is a lot smaller overhead. And so you can, you can get uh, recognition in much smaller increments. And this is maybe one of the That's things a really good point. that helps yeah. motivate people. Yeah, I sort of, I just sort of get the last word in there. That's a really good point. So the, you know, obviously going to open science, trying to get more of this to be conducted in real time, which, which also involves rethinking potentially the peer review process, having more of it be post hoc. I think we're seeing some interesting examples of that right now, actually with COVID, um, where a lot, of, a lot of the work's happening in the preprint servers, um, which is still fairly time intensive. But nonetheless, in other words, you could start to imagine different publication models effectively that are more incremental and again, you could still, you're going to still work on how it's going to be reputation based because that in the end is what we're about in science. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's, it's going to be hopefully interesting days, right? As we try to move to more modern models. Hey, thanks a lot, Jim. Great talk. Yeah, thanks. With that, uh, I think it's about uh, time also. So Jim, uh, thanks a lot. Very interesting, lots of work to do and uh, looking forward to see some, uh, some more great results here. Great. And if anybody else has questions, feel free to just, you know, shoot me a letter or whatever. And uh, well, you we can have the conversation offline. It's part of the uh, <laughs> possibility for eternal fame for our audience. <laughs> That's right. All, all 300 or whatever. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot.